Welcome back to the Taproot Podcast, where each time we come to you with great ideas for your improvement program and insight and ideas for your root cause analysis. Today, we're going to talk about a topic that is a very hot topic. Um, we hear about it a lot. Uh, Did you say clients. a very hot topic? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> a very hot to- topic. Um, our clients are are contacting us on a regular basis now because they are using Taproot with Hop that has been brought into their companies. And there are some really great ways that uh, our clients can do that. And we're going to talk about that today. But first, I want to introduce Mark Paradise and Alex Paradise. Welcome. We're glad to be here. Thank you, Mana. And you are going to, first of all, educate me on what is Hop. So I think the first thing to do is to get into the five principles of Hop. And the first principle is people make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I think with us, that's, you know, kind of the starting point of an investigation. A lot of people think, um, you know, when they have an incident, they're looking at at, at what happened and they're, they're looking for people to blame, they're looking for problems. And I think the first thing you have to recognize when you're thinking about people in your system mm -hmm. is they're gonna make mistakes. We uh, teach the Stop a Human Error course and in that, one of the earliest slides you talk about is what's the best a human can do? One in 10,000. And One and mistake in 10,000 tries for excellent performance. Now, that's really excellent performance with a good system, good training, good procedures, mm -hmm. good everything. Maybe they make one mistake in 10,000. But that's pretty pretty good human performance. Yeah, but it's not one in 10,000 if you say put them in emergency. No, it isn't because you're going to be under stress then. And, and if you're not well trained, you're down to like maybe 50-50 <laughs> or maybe worse. Yeah, an un, untrained in an emergency, bad systems. It's bad. I, I call 50-50, you'd never play Russian roulette when it's 50-50, <laughs> would you? No. I wouldn't play Russian roulette anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you do every day. Maybe. You um, drive home. That's sort of driving Russian roulette. <laughs> So we, we recognize first that people make mistakes and that they're going to make mistakes. And, and even the best systems in the world, there is an element of human error that's going to occur. So the next thing that kind of comes in with that is blame fixes nothing. That's saying people make mistakes and just blaming them for their mistakes isn't going to fix the problem. Now, it can have a purpose. It isn't me, it's him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I always I always bring it up um, with my students when I'm talking about you know what uh, how do you get to a world class culture I've never met a company that got there by firing people to get to the best company ever and uh, you hear it a lot though that people go if we just hired better people these things wouldn't happen you hear it all the time yeah. people say things like that and you always should reply yes you're the first one that should go. <laughs> But so, so there's that, this element of blame that people maybe even default to. They default to blame. And we have to recognize that that doesn't fix problems. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't even fix people very well. Right. And so far, like. It, but it's embedded in human nature. It does seem absolutely. to be. Absolutely. And, and so far, these first two are lining right up with what we teach in Taproot as well. No. Yeah. And so you, you accept that people are going to make mistakes you accept that just blaming them for making mistakes isn't a good solution. So the next thing you need to do is figure out how to learn from improvement. And, and the hot principle would be learning is key mm -hmm. to improvement because we can't just say we're going to blame people and move to the next thing. That doesn't seem to work and it creates a bad culture. So we have to approach learning the right way. Um, and I, I think that's a pretty... That's a very broad statement. It, it is. <laughs> Because, you know, it doesn't really say what's the best way to learn, right. does it? Yeah. Um, because everybody learns differently, too. Well, they say we do learn differently. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what's the best method uh, of learning? And I think we'll talk about maybe some of that in, in a bit. The, the fourth principle is context drives behavior. Um, and they, they say, okay, if we're going to learn, we need to first look at the context and the way people behave. Because that's going to help us understand um can I change one thing? I think it should be context drives action. And why, and why do you think it should be action? Because I, behavior is uh, a loaded word. Um, if your kid exhibits bad behavior, what does that mean? 
You're a terrible parent. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alex. <laughs> that's what we feel like. I think it's a terrible child, uh, obviously. Yeah, yeah. See, I'm getting back to the blame yeah, thing, I, right? I wonder why he thinks that. Well, so. behavior <laughs> is more of a trend. Behavior tends to say that the person who is doing it is responsible mm-hmm. for it. But if you take context drives action, it is, takes the blame out of that sentence. And so I really think it should be context drives action rather than context drives behavior to take the, we just mentioned blame. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't want to use a a word that has a blame connotation to it. Does that make any sense? Yeah, and and I think it aligns because a lot of, um, we'll, we'll say, hot gurus were very, you know, famously against behavior based safety programs. And because that behavior thing was saying it's it's a person problem. Mm -hmm. And I I think it's right to say it's a context. Um, I've always said it's it's we're setting people up for success or failure. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing as companies. We're setting people up for success or failure. And that context behind what we did to set them up is important. And I think this third thing uh, or fourth thing, context drives behavior actually goes back to the first thing people make mistakes well you can use context that reduces the the likelihood of mistakes so you get to be where you know we even had seen a mistake for a long long time um, or we haven't had a major accident for a long long time maybe we've had some minor incidents but we never have major accidents around here anymore and so you get you um, you get away from the people mm-hmm. make mistakes things because your systems are so good, which includes your people, that you don't have these blame-oriented big accidents anymore. Well, and the <clears throat> the conversation piece of um, Hop, I think, feel like really helps fuel that because you're talking to the end user of the job, and a very often someone who writes the procedure isn't even asking the end user. Um, well, that's that's a problem with how they write problem. procedures. It is. It is. <laughs> that isn't. And, a, that isn't. A, everybody has to follow that bad way to do but things. But opening that conversation up with the person doing the job is really going to help get them to where they're not afraid to talk, and you're going to learn a lot about what they need to do to to provide uh, the task that they need to do. And I, I think that kind of brings it into the the final uh, the final fifth thing, the fifth principle of Hop which is how we respond Mm -hmm. to failure, to incidents, to these non-conformities matter, Mm -hmm. right? So how we respond to it. We recognize people are gonna make mistakes. We recognize blaming them isn't the answer. We're gonna figure out how we're gonna learn from this. Mm -hmm. We're gonna look at the context and the way that leadership responds matters. And so I think, you know, we've heard stories of you know an incident occurs and the supervisor or the plant manager is coming out and looking for who screwed up what do you mean we've heard stories i've been there <laughs> we've watched it right we've watched well, i've it. been in that circle i was getting ready to say what's the end of it where are you on i, I've been on, I think i've been on both ends of that i, I have been on both as well <laughs> But I, but I think that response, that's the final principle is that response matters. The way we approach um, in, investigations matters, and it can affect your culture. Mm-hmm. Um, in the leadership book, uh, we had kind of three different uh, leadership philosophies. Can you kind of tell us those three philosophies? Well, there's, there's the blame-oriented organization, mm-hmm. which is obviously counter to this. We would never have one of those, right. would we? <laughs> Where the first thing you do is who's to blame. And, and you can sort of tell the question they ask after there's been an incident. If they first ask who did it, you're in a blame-oriented mm-hmm. culture. Um, the second one is the crisis management orientation. And once again, you can tell by the questions they ask. If they ask, well, how long is it going to be till we get back into production? We now are just going to handle this crisis and get back into production as fast as we can. And that you're in the crisis management mode. And the other one is sort of the learning or opportunity to improve mode. And in that case, they'll be, well, tell me about how this happened. And this is, this mm-hmm. is you need to go talk to the field, to people in the field, to be able to understand how it happened. You're not going to be able to understand from the ivory tower, although I really don't like that appearance of things because I don't think a, uh, there's always somebody between the ivory tower mm-hmm. and the guy doing the work. And the question is, how much filtering is there going on on the way up? So you really want to hear what happened. 
and then you want to figure out how did it happen and why did it happen and that's the whole mm -hmm. process of root cause analysis and I, I always like it, these the idea of um, oh you know you always you always hear people say it's work is imagined versus work is done well that that's putting uh, a wall someplace where these people never know what those people are doing. Well, that's the whole wrong idea in the first place. You should know what's going on in the field. And if they're not doing what you think needs to be done, well, either you're thinking wrong or they're doing wrong. There usually is a best way to do something. And yes, that might change as things change, but if things change and you need to change what the way you're doing things, there ought to be a process to do that. And if it happens a lot, well, maybe you don't have very, very good rules and things to start with, but you know, you really need to get beyond this idea that people aren't going to understand how people do work. Well, and when you're dealing with, say, shift work, you've got multiple people doing the same job. And so, are they all going to do it exactly alike? Each one's probably going to have a certain twist to how they do something based on how they mentally process things. So well, maybe. So you could, it, it depends on, and, and they, the, the idea is how complex is the work. Mm -hmm. and, and when I say complex, I don't mean like it's a really hard job to do because mm -hmm. there's a lot of hard jobs that you can do procedurally. Mm -hmm. But it, it's how much complexity is in the work. So, you know, when you think of a complex system, a lot of interconnected parts where you don't have visibility in how all these things are functioning, that might be a case where everybody that's coming into a system may be coming in at a different point. There may be different variables. But how many systems are actually like that is something I don't... Well, we've got a success story with an example on this. Um, some guys came to Taproot Training, and they their, their, their facility was going to be shut down because they were losing money. And after they took taproot training and they went back and started doing incident investigations, they found out that there was an incident at the start of every shift. And it was happening because each shift was running the plant differently. They had their own best way. Mm -hmm. And that meant they had to shift from that other oh, bad shift to the good shift's way of doing it. And that meant there were four different ways because there was rotating three shifts, but there was an off shift. When they came on, they'd have to get it back to their way. And every shift they were losing... I think it was about 5% of their production total they were losing to dumping product while they shifted from one method to another. And and it, it took them, th in three investigations, they said, nobody's running this the same way. Nobody's following the procedure, mm -hmm. which I don't know where this work is imagined, but somebody someday had written a procedure, right? I don't, know, cabinet somebody I don't know who did it. It <laughs> might have been one of the guys on the floor wrote a procedure, and that's the way he liked to run the plant. Right. And he's long retired now, and everybody's coming up with better ideas, and nobody's paying attention to the procedure anyhow, so why change it? And, and so they have all these different ways, and they had to get him in a room and say, listen, guys, if you'd, we're all going to lose our job unless you can figure out one way to do this where we don't dump product every shift, where we run this place the same way, shift after mm -hmm. shift after shift. And they did because they were going to get fired <laughs> otherwise. They compromised, they agreed, they sat in the room till they beat out a procedure that they could all live by and all do. And, and that saved them enough money that right there, they were now a money-making plant versus a money-losing plant, and they all saved all their jobs. And they had a bunch of other things they found out. Once they had, once they had this major upset every shift taken care of, it was then a lot easier to find the smaller problems that were going mm -hmm. on and fix those. But all those problems are fixed by what's going on out in the field, not by what's going on in somebody's head. Yeah. That's where those conversations come in. And 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 once again. With Taproot, you go out and see what's going on in the field. You talk to the people in the field. You get, and they understand eventually or right away that this isn't a blame-oriented system. Yep. And they then, um, I don't want to say cooperate because that makes it sound like they're going to be non-cooperating. <laughs> exactly. But it's <laughs> but it's they eager. participate. They're eager yes. to participate because they know it's going to make things better. Well, they can get some ownership in it. 
and getting ownership in your job makes you want to do it better. Well, they think they have ownership yeah. when they do it the way they, they want to. <laughs> That's true. But when things are, they don't want to take ownership in when things go bad. No. So. Well, <laughs> and that's back to the blame-oriented, yes. <laughs> blame-oriented uh, uh, environment. So those are the five principles. Did we get the fifth We, we did all five. Um, How we respond matters. Yeah, last so, one, right? so those are five principles. And I think we've kind of jumped already into, mm-hmm. which is where do they fit and where does Taproot fit in these? Now, I, I think with those three philosophies that you were kind of talking about, the blame, the firefighting, and the opportunity vision, um, we, we fall into the opportunity vision, mm-hmm. the idea that, you know, every failure is an opportunity for finding something missing in your system that we can do better, that we can improve. And I, I think that's where we kind of fit in. On so, so it doesn't work when you're in the blame vision. Why? Because in the blame vision, you get the... I don't know what happened. Yeah, well, I didn't do it. You can't. You can't prove I did it. And there's no evidence I did it. You know, it gets to be the. the I'm gonna. I'm gonna not say anything because if I say anything, I'm gonna get in trouble. And then you know, if you go to the crisis vision, well, you don't really even care what happened as long as you can get things back up quickly. It's how fast you can crisis manage. In fact, a crisis management plant, the corrective actions are usually what you can do to recover the plant. I lived in that one. I, my, one of my first um, sites that I worked in out of college, uh, we had a really good and on system, which is from lean and the idea is if you have a problem, resources come flooding to that problem and we get it operational. And you know, I'd been there for about a month or two and the, the ops manager was like, well, tell me what you're thinking about. What do, you, what do you think about our system that you've been here for a while? And I was like, well, it's really good for firefighting. And, and it doesn't seem to f- like solve problems forever, but it's really good at firefighting. And he took that, he took that really well, honestly, because, you know, upstart college student comes say here. Well, he probably so, thought that was praise. He, yeah. Well, no, no, he goes, you know. It sounded good when he said Hey, yeah. We were really good at it. All right. The biggest emergency. He, he goes, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. This is a firefighting system. It's good. You need to put out fires, mm-hmm. right? We need to be quick and efficient at putting out fires. That keeps the things running. But I, I think he, you know, the idea was, hey, we needed to go further because we're not really fixing some of the long-term problems. Well, as we're talking with people throughout the entire, like, while things are going well, which Hop talks about, you know, talk to people and learn their jobs while things are going right, not necessarily while things are going wrong. Well, okay, so let's start with going wrong. We already mentioned that many times, not right? <laughs> So the going wrong part is doing what we call an incident investigation. Yes. What does the hop people call it? Well, theirs would also, well, they wouldn't call it incident investigation. No. They, they call it learning team. They call maybe a learning, maybe learning team, team or is another name. I'm trying to remember what the other name is. That's a question we get a lot. People want to know how to integrate the learning team aspect with their taproot investigation. So so let's kind of, let's before we jump into that, I would say where does taproot fit with mm-hmm. these principles? And then we can say, how do we integrate these okay. two? Um, so when you think about the principles, the core elements of Taproot, the, the first part is understanding what happened before you get to the why. And I think that aligns really well with context drives action. Yes. What well, you're, you're talking about what the, not the core elements of Taproot are, but the process of doing a, a root cause analysis. Yes. Okay. The core elements of the taproot process. Okay, I got you. Yes. Doing an investigation. Doing an investigation. Doing a facilitation of a, um, I can't can't think of the alternate term for it. I'll think of it sooner or later. So, but but the core parts to any investigation, and we say a good investigation, is going to be understanding the context. Mm -hmm. We say building a snap chart, that timeline. And so that's going to help you understand the context behind what happened, not mm-hmm. just why. The other elements that we jump into right away with Taproot is we look at how can we reduce blame in our investigation. It's good to say blame fixes nothing, but like Mark said, it's a default. Right. It's a default emotion. It's a default response. Mm-hmm. So you have to kind of combat that. You have to be active at combating that. It's human nature. I mean, the first thing that pops in somebody's head is a hoop. It's who's screwing it up. It is. I mean, it's just human nature. Whether so you like, said it or not, that's what people think. So like for us, when we write our Snapchart, we're not using names. We're using functions, yes. job titles. So that way, when you know the person that got hurt came in and they're looking at the Snapchart, they don't see John mm-hmm. screwed up. They, they see there was a problem with uh, rigor one mm-hmm. or there was a problem with uh, you know forklift driver you know you know we say this and we don't put names in the snap chart 
But don't you think everybody already knows who that name is well, before you ever get there? I, I'll tell you, I've had a ton of clients, and they say that it's like a, a change in the room because they, you know, especially if you've got like a, a union shop or something like that, to see it as a job title and not as a person's name changes the temperature of the room and it makes people more willing to share information. And I think that's important because even if they know, yeah, it was me who screwed mm -hmm. up, it, it makes a difference to say we're looking at our system here and okay. what went wrong with our system. And so, coming. and I, I think that ties in with that, with that blame portion. So um, another mm -hmm. element that ties in with this would be causal factors. Mm -hmm. And I've heard people argue that causal factors were against hop you know, because uh, the first thing is humans make mistake. Of course, somebody made a mistake, and just saying we had a mistake is is it's blamed now. But causal factors are a good way of breaking down mm -hmm. your incident to see where your system broke down. What were the undesired human actions or equipment failures? And and so by having those, you can see where people or equipment failed in your system, and you have to identify those because you have to understand those gaps. Well, yeah, because the some of the things they talk about are the things that take place when an incident happened were taking place when the incident didn't happen, too. So it's that lining up of the things that potentially could have gone wrong um, that end up causing that incident. Yes, that's true some of the time. It's not, not true all, all of the time. time. Yeah. So I, I think it's important to understand in the context of that incident where those breakdowns occurred. Mm -hmm. Now, another counter that, or not counter, but another way that people think about it is they say, oh, well, every incident is unique. So is there value in breaking those down? That's sometimes what you hear is, well, every incident, you know, they, 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 rag, they, they rag on the, uh, the Swiss cheese model because, mm -hmm. oh, well, those holes don't stay the same size and those cheeses shift around. Who said they did, didn't? That's, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Nobody said that they had to be stagnant. Oh, come on. But my cheese always has the same size holes. My cheese always has the same size holes. <laughs> but, but the idea is that, yes, every incident is different. So you have to understand the context and you have to see where that unique incident broke down. But that doesn't mean that there isn't significant learning yeah, that, that's going to happen. Learning. Because any incident that occurred is a guaranteed gap in your system. Mm -hmm. It's not a mystery. I don't have to, to you know, assume and, and say, oh, I just can't fix every problem. Well, I can at least fix the problems I know about. Mm -hmm. So you have to find causal factors and understand where your system broke down. Now, I think where the the tie-in with um, basically the the four and five looking at how we respond and how we learn I, I think those are important to tie with the root cause tree and and how with taproot we've really in cat we've really captured mm -hmm. the the systematic approach because I think you know, learning the way we learn, how we learn about an incident and break it down, it really can vary. If I put two experts in a room and I don't give them a systematic approach, I'm going to be doing what I like to call bias-based RCA. My biases, my experiences drive my results. And you're an expert. I'm an expert. <laughs> the more expert you are, the more you know you have the right answer. Yeah, you know you have the right Well, I may be an expert in one or two things. And so I'm going to always find, if I, was, if I was a maintenance guy, I'm going to find the equipment issues. Or I'm going to find where the operators mm -hmm. screwed it up. That's what I'm going to probably do is find where the operators broke my equipment. Because I'm an expert in looking for that at this point. Um, so your expertise can be a good thing in investigations, but it also can bias you and narrow. And so we, we realize there's... It almost always does. It does, it does. And, he, and, and so we realized you had to give people structure and you had to provide guidance for them so that they wouldn't miss those opportunities. So again, Taproot's gonna make sure that you're asking those human performance questions. You're not gonna leave out things like fatigue or, um, looking at complex systems or looking at work direction. You're gonna make sure that you're looking at both individual performance, team performance, and most importantly, your favorite category on the root cause tree. Management systems. Management systems. You know, I, I think the hot people a lot of times talk about um, 
error traps and precursors. Mm -hmm. And error traps and precursors are really just root causes on the back side of the tree. The difference is they don't have as many. Mm -hmm. I think they have like 22, some, it's some number of error traps and precursors, depending on whose flavor you look at. So it, it could be 50 maybe, but... It could the, be 10. It could be, be 10, because <laughs> it need to be simplified. Yeah. But, but the answer is, well, those are just root causes, or maybe they're causal factors in some cases, and you need to get down to the root causes. But that really is the backside of the tree, because what you're really talking about is how do you improve human performance? And, and what I've heard people say is, well, we need to train the operators to go out and look for error traps and precursors so they can fix them. Operators aren't out looking for things to do while they're doing work. They've got work to do. Mm -hmm. And usually they have enough work to do to keep them busy their whole eight hour, 12 hour, however many hour their shift is, and maybe a little overtime. They're busy the whole time. They aren't out, oh, let's see if I can go fix the system today. That isn't their job. Their job is to do the work. So one way you find these error traps and precursors is by incidents, right? You go out after the incident, you find where the error traps and precursors were, where the root causes were on the back side of the root cause tree. And, and you can go out and look proactively. So you might form a team of people to go out and do that, or you might have individual people do it, but they probably aren't trying to do it while they're doing work. It is, it is you're giving them a job that they're probably not well trained for, that they, that they, it interferes with their normal job, and it probably causes more problems. Well, that operator who's sitting there day in, day out, processing that work, most likely at one time or another has come up with a better idea on how to process that job. And if nobody's talking to them about it, maybe, how can they get their ideas out there? Maybe, maybe not. And here's the, here's the key. And the key is they might think the procedure re needs to be rewritten mm -hmm. when actually the control board needs to be changed or the digital control system needs to be have the display modified to make it easier for them to do their job, not to give them more of a procedure. Mm -hmm. Somebody might say, that guy needs more training. He doesn't understand this display. Hey, the display is just so complicated. He's not, he's not going to, you know, you know why, do we, a mess. why do we need to make it like a PhD <laughs> training to be able to operate this plan when you could change the display and it makes it much easier for the person. And the operator might not think of that. They may think, well, yeah, a really experienced operator, like me, we can do this when it's the new guy and the new guy thinks, well, I just don't have enough experience yet. And, and both those are wrong answers, right? That's it's, where it's, talking to them helps. Yeah. So. Well, if you recognize what the problem is, that's mm -hmm. the, that when you, when you think, well, the guys in the field are just going to say, I know what the problem is, it's this, sometimes they'll have mm -hmm. that right. Sometimes they won't see the problem because they're so used to doing it that way, they won't see that it needs to be done a different way. Mm -hmm. So I think the, I, I don't know if I'd call it a lie, but the, the self-deception, mm -hmm. I'll say the self-deception that companies have is every, we, we have all the knowledge we need. We have all the knowledge we need to fix our problems. And I don't believe that's true. I believe we have a lot of great knowledge. Our people have really good insights to things. They're usually experts on what they do. Mm -hmm. they're, at least they're experts on doing it, and they can tell you the context behind why they do it this way. They may be wrong. Mm -hmm. Sometimes sometimes people figure out the wrong way to do things, and, and it gets them in trouble. And even it might have been successful for a very long time, but it will still weaken your system, right? Um, so I, I think the, the, the deception is the idea that we have all the knowledge, and I think and in hop, the deception is, well, you people above a certain point in the corporation, you don't have any good knowledge, <laughs> but those guys down on the floor, I they understand, they have all the knowledge, <laughs> So if you just ask them. So in my mind, that, that is a little bit of a problem because, and I see this with companies that do, you know, five whys or any of these bias-based, experience-based RCA methods, because you are the one that knows the answer. You've got to know the answer to put it in here. Mm -hmm. And so it limits what you kind of come up with with corrective actions. And you really just come up with things that you already knew. And it doesn't really seem to help drive people to go beyond what they already know and beyond what their common issue is. So this is something that I've seen in investigations where we do kind of more of a brainstorming approach. I used to do a lot of those in, in, in manufacturing. and. 
I could see people spending weeks coming up with all these corrective actions that had no, nothing to do with the actual problem and what the what the data said the issues were and what the what the results ended up being. So they would come up with 50, 20, 100 corrective actions that didn't apply, just like Mark said. They didn't they were, have the root cause. They didn't. They missed the root cause because they didn't know that they were looking for yes. root cause. They were looking for something else. And um, I can see it in the, in the brainstorming. I mean, again, there's pros and cons to things like that. But without guidance, it's mm-hmm. just rabbit holes. Yeah. So I think it's important. You've got to, like you said, get the right people in mm-hmm. the room. So you have to have somebody in the room that has that knowledge of this is the way we do the work, actually do it. Right. And I think equally you have to have that knowledge of the people that go, well, this is why these safeguards were in place. Mm -hmm. This is why the procedure was written this way. There's a reason why. Hopefully you haven't forgotten that or lost it, right? Sometimes you, you, that person that wrote that procedure is no longer at the company. The person with the real knowledge Mm -hmm. of how the process was designed. Yeah, is gone. Which, you know... happening a lot. There's an engineer involved for a reason sometimes. Mm -hmm. There are calculations and reasons things are the way they are and it's one of the reasons they have management change so it can go back through that engineering review, back through that management review, back through a what are we going to accept for risk kind of review and not just say well I think it ought to be this way because I work here. And and I can think of um, in in my manufacturing plant, uh, one of my manufacturing plants that I worked in, uh, we had a our, we'll call him chief engineer, it wasn't his title, but he was the chief engineer for the plant. Uh, he had 40 plus years, I think he was 42 years with the company, at the same facility. You know, an engineer with wow. 42 years experience at the same facility, he knew everything. Absolutely. Uh, loved the guy, he was yeah. an amazing guy. Um, we knew he was leaving a year out. He, he mm-hmm. gave us a retirement date a year out. And he did that so that he could train up mm-hmm. the, his replacement and all of the younger engineers. Now, the sad thing is, I don't believe some of the engineers that were there that got that wonderful training from that, 40, they're no longer with the company. Mm. So you didn't go, you didn't trade a 42-year person for a person at the beginning of their 42-year career at the same facility. And, and I think a lot of times that's going to happen a lot more frequently now. That knowledge gets lost. That, yeah. that, that. That it's not even tribal knowledge because it is a little bit tribal knowledge, but it's institutional memory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that institutional memory gets shorter and shorter these days. Well, and I mean that was great. He gave you a year advance notice, but you know what? Life is unpredictable. You could have had a heart attack. He and you didn't get I mean, any, any days any, notice. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, things happen all the time. You know, who who, you know, can someone always fill that spot? Does have someone have that knowledge? And you know, what do you put in place to make sure that those types of things have happened? So tying that kind of in with the response part and where we're at, you know, we believe the root cause tree is a guaranteed way to make sure that your response to um, an investigation is right. We're going to make sure that your people are asking those expert questions. They're looking at human performance, best practices, Mm -hmm. and they're looking for gaps in your system. And I think that is important to to kind of integrate. Now, where these five principles kind of stop in my mind, they don't continue on to I think what is the most important part of an investigation, mm-hmm. which is actually fixing the problems that you find. Right, getting to your root cause, fixing the problem. And so I, I think where Taproot kind of goes beyond these principles is the way we approach corrective actions. Mm-hmm. So when we think about corrective actions, we teach a method called SMARTER. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everybody's got smart corrective actions, we have smarter corrective actions. <laughs> um, so, so we think about how do we make corrective actions more effective, how do we set ourselves up for success when writing corrective actions, um, and I think that's like the first step, right, is how do I set myself up when writing it to know that I'm writing strong corrective actions. We also incorporate things like the safeguard hierarchy to make sure that we're doing the most effective corrective actions possible. and. Because we recognize that everybody's not a human performance expert, we also have the Corrective Action Helper Guide to make sure that people understand how to fix the problems they've found. The interesting part is a lot of times people will just keep doing the same corrective actions that don't work. Mm -hmm. They've already seen they don't work, but they'll recommend them again. It's like more training. Right. We're going to do more training. Why are you doing more? What was wrong with your last training? Is there something wrong with your training? (laughs) Or, Or... 
we're going to rewrite the procedure. What makes you think you're going to write it any more successfully if you didn't write it successfully last time? And so you get these standard things that they've seen. Mm -hmm. In fact, I know a place where the guy was copying the corrective actions out of old reports and putting them in his because he knew they'd get approved. And, and, and my <laughs> thought it was, well, wait a second, if you did this already and it, didn't and it happened again, <laughs> why are you going to do it again? Yeah. What, what is doing the same thing again and again and yes, expecting different insanity. results? Yes, insanity. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, again, I, I, think, I think the principles frame up what is important, mm -hmm. which is we have to recognize that we can't rely on blame mm -hmm that we set people up for success or failure with our systems and that as leadership the, the way we approach investigations matter now i think we all agree with those five principles i've, mm -hmm. I've never felt besides the, the wording change of behavior to action and, I, and that's just the removing blame that's yes all. that's just trying to reduce blame in it i would say we agree with those i think again what i see is different with our approach than say other um practitioners mm -hmm. Uh, approach is again what is the actions that we take and where do we focus our actions and I think with Taproot we focus on the system and we focus on things as a company we can control and we focus on the most effective things because we know that people aren't effective safeguards right that's principle number that's one well yeah and that's why they want to design systems where you can fail safely so yep. Yep. so <laughs> they're expecting you to fail yep so I, I think with the taproot approach, we don't spend a lot of time on trying to fix the person. Mm -hmm. um, I think coaching people to catch their own mistakes, it's not a bad thing. It's just largely maybe a waste of time. Um, people aren't very good at catching their own mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I, I think in, in our approach, people do it all the time. They just don't do it consistently. Mm -hmm. You can't consistently catch your own mistakes. If that's your only preventative tool is catching your own mistakes, you may do it 50%, you may do it 70%, you may do it 90% of the time. It's that 10% that you don't that gets you in trouble. Yeah, so the backside of the tree is a really good thing. What are the things that we can do that have been proven to make people more reliable? Mm -hmm. and more consistent and so that's the back side of the tree but with taproot we don't want to just stop with the human performance stuff we also look at the safeguards we also look at the how we design our system to set it up for success so you kind of talk about that mm -hmm. safety capacity right it's what kind of what you were hinting at there which is the idea that you can build safeguards into your system defense in depth mm -hmm. that will catch mistakes before they result in in failure and I, I think there's a, an interesting um... and, and sometimes the point is how obvious is the mistake if you can yeah. make the mistake obvious then people could catch it mm -hmm. if the mistake is invisible then you don't catch it before some bad right. happens that's a bad thing if you can't smell the gases leaking if you can't see the gases leaking, well, there we go. you can't hear the gases it, leaking. You make it smell like whatever it smells right. like. Whatever yeah. that, that, <laughs> is it sulfur that I gas so. smells like? I just know when you smell it, you think, you know it. So that, <laughs> is, that is natural gas leaking here. You know it. <laughs> so, uh, again, if we, if, we go through, if we go through our processes and look for that defense, I, I think that's the right approach. So, again, I think with Taproot, we align with the principles. Mm -hmm. I agree with them. There's nothing. I have no problems we want to make sure that the, and fit in with the principles mm -hmm. we fit in with them yeah and that's the key pain point that people call us about they're like okay we, how does it fit in how does it fit in we are we are doing this our company is doing hop um but i know how important the taproot tools are to be able to get rid of the bias and all those kind of things and they are they are like are calling us in a panic going, so, so the number one work? thing is they're going to talk about learning teams or the other one i came up with the name mm -hmm. learning meetings learning, learning, meetings. Meetings. learning <laughs> meetings they called them another place called them and and those i hate to say this it's like the three pizza investigation mm -hmm. i don't know if you remember the three pizza investigation there was a guy at a place and he said, I gotta learn how to do taproot fast because we gotta turn these around. We're in a turnaround period. We can't let people do not do work for days on end. So what we'll do is this. We'll get uh, we'll get it we'll get it done in three days. Mm -hmm. These guys were on shift work and he'd get them to come in the first day and they'd draw the snap chart. 
and the snap chart was learning what were you doing out there. Mm -hmm. And then you can compare that to work as imagined, if you want to call it that, or what the procedure said, if it, if it varies from the procedure, or why did it vary from the procedure. So you get this all down in your snap chart, and then you're ready to say, okay, where do we go from here? Well, we go from here for saying, well, what were the what were the things that allowed this to go along this chain to cause this accident? And those are going to be causal factors, initiating mm -hmm. things and things that allowed it to continue. Then you're going to take those causal factors and you're going to say, okay, why did those happen? What what contributed to those happening? What were the um, what were the error traps that allowed those mm -hmm. to happen? And you could say error traps rather right. than root yeah. causes, right? Same same concept. Mm -hmm. And you're going to find those air traps, and what are you going to do to them? You're going to fix them. Fix them. Oh, corrective actions. Same <laughs> concept. Same concept. You're going to fix the air traps, or maybe you're going to have to redesign the system. You always can change it and add more capacity or defense in depth. And and that's the that's the standard reactive process. Their learning teams are usually a reactive process, usually. They try to not be reactive. Well, they, they, say, but, they, but, they say learn from normal work. Yes. They say, well, that's the proactive way. Well, that's what I say. That's right. what they say. They, they, they want to do So now, now you say the second step is be proactive. Um, we want to learn from normal work. Mm -hmm. well, what are you doing to learn from normal work? Well, usually you're going out with people in the field and learning what's going mm -hmm. on. You're observing these air traps or... What people are doing differently at work is done versus work is imagined. Build it out on a snap chart. Line out. Mm -hmm. This is the way we do yeah, work. Exactly. Yes. Or, wait a second, that's not the way we do work. We do it this way. Yeah. Oh, look, there's a difference. I wonder why that is. I wonder if that's the most efficient way to do things. I wonder if there's a better way. And maybe you need to talk to a different guy or a different shift or a different whatever and say, well, your shift does it this way, but nobody else is doing it that mm -hmm. way. Why is yours different? What does that make mm -hmm. happen better? Or maybe it's worse. And when I did my talk, uh, I did a talk on combining taproot and learning teams at the summit. And one of the things that is missing, because I think the snap chart, it, it's very similar what mm -hmm. they're doing, right? Lining out work is imagined versus work is done snap chart. We use that for proactive with chat. What's different about when you link in taproot into your learning teams is you're taking that root cause tree that expert guided system and you can then give a way to focus on those human performance categories well okay what procedures do we have in this step what you guys aren't using them well what's is there something wrong with the procedure i can look at is it not mm -hmm. followed is it wrong is it not being used at all. Written in the wrong paragraph format rather than step-by-step. So by I step. can use those to help facilitate and guide people in that conversation as an expert in human performance. So I'm not I'm not getting this variability between people. Or they can use it in the dictionary without an expert in human performance exactly. to get that same kind of but questioning. That's what I'm saying. Those questions They're make in me there. that They're in the dictionary. Yeah, they make me that expert as a facilitator. You're going to say you don't have to have a special expert facilitator doing this for you. The tools will guide that exactly. person to do. And so by combining, you know, the structure and guidance of Taproot into this, it just makes the system run so much smoother mm -hmm. and also more consistently. And I think consistency is the biggest at least it's the biggest complaint I've heard is, yeah, we can get great results when this person does it, but when this person does it... Well, I got, I got one more other than that. When you get the great results when this person has it, you're getting their great results. Yes. If you get another great person in there, it may be a totally different set of great results yep. you get. And, and that indicates a problem. If two experts come up with different answers and then which expert's better? Which great answer is better? <laughs> and and the problem is, you, and the other thing is, how many great experts do you have? And maybe you need to get your regular people to be able to solve problems like they were great experts, better than great experts, because they actually consider more than what that great expert was considering. And I've had people say this, well, Taproot's too prescriptive. It, it limits your thinking. I've never had, I've them. never had it, I've never had somebody go, you know, here's the root cause and it wasn't something on the tree or sometimes it was not even a root cause, it was a causal factor and there's more things down below that could cause it and they don't, it isn't limiting their thinking, it's because 
they think it's going to limit their ability to prescribe what mm -hmm. the corrective action is. They're going to come up with that one other thing that isn't on there that it, possibly might not be on probably there. Probably <laughs> not, but... <laughs> so I, I think we've kind of shown how these two blend together. Yeah, you all have really wrapped it up really well there um, from what you were saying, Mark, on how all that would look going through... Actually and, and I got one process. more thing to add. Yes. This isn't just a safety thing. Mm -hmm. You're talk. I mean, a lot of people talk about um, learning teams or HOP, and, and they talk about it from a safety perspective. But when you're improving human performance, you're not just improving um, safety performance. Right. It's you're improving improving human reliability, mm -hmm. and improving human reliability uh, can influence quality. It can influence your production rate. It can influence a lot of different things. And not just safety, mm -hmm. and and most people don't make a mistake and think I'm going to make a safety mistake. <laughs> they they make a mistake, and it could be it could affect any number right. of things, and they're not thinking about making a mistake for safety's sake. So I think these principles and taproot obviously could be applied over all mm -hmm. sorts of different things, and not just safety. Oh, I agree. I think that's a a really great way to kind of wrap it up. Um, I, you know, it all goes back to when people call us and they're looking for consistency and standardization in their program and they're, it is always a huge pain point. And now they're calling us with the, how do we combine these two things? <laughs> and cause they want that consistency and standardization. It's been proven to them for years is using taproot and they don't want to lose it. They want to make it all work together. And I think you all explained it really, really well on how people can do that. Um, if you all would like any more information about how you can take your HOP program and Taproot and your Root Cause Analysis program, we are happy to talk to you about that. You can contact us at info at taproot.com and you can reach out to Alex. Mark, uh, we've got a whole team here that's happy to help and happy to um, go through an explanation with you. If you don't use Taproot already, we have uh, executive briefings we can do for you that's free and we can kind of go over a lot of this um, for you. Um, and, guys, and, and if they want to talk to anybody, if they if they have the question that you get all the time, yes. how do I combine these? I'm sure Alex would be glad to talk to him on that. <laughs> Alex can do this. And I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll, I'll be even gladder to talk to you. Gladder. I'll be even gladder. <laughs> More gladder. gladder. More gladder. Uh, I will be, I'll be happy to talk More to you. More gladdest. <laughs> <laughs> Most gladdest. Most gladdest. Uh, I will be happy to talk to you at the Taproot Summit. We have a human performance track. And it's a great time to, to meet up and... Every, every year we have a human form strike yeah. at the summit. Yep. And, and so it's a great, a great time to meet up for it and, and talk with other people that mm -hmm. are using Both. this and applying them together. Yep. You'll, you'll find lots of people there you can talk to about how they do this how also. How they do it. Not just how we recommend it, but how they've done it. And right. they love to share it. They yes. love to share their insight into helping other people. And yeah. It's a great opportunity. When is the summit? Yep. <laughs> the summit is in the spring of in every the year. Spring and of if every they want to learn when go to it's going to be. Taproot.com yes. slash summit. Well, they can just go to taproot.com and click on summit. And they'll take you right there. They'll tell you when you it'll be. You can go and you can click it every year. <laughs> every and year see you can do that. Where it's going to be. Exactly. <laughs> so. Anyway, guys, thank you. Um, that was a lot of information. I know we had some funny conversations leading up to this to see how this was all going to turn out. I think it turned we out could, really listen, well. We could talk for hours we on this topic. We could talk for Wait it for part two. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. If you enjoyed this um, and you want to get more information like this, please subscribe to any of the channels that you're watching this on or listening to this on. We're on a lot of different platforms. And we will see you back here next time. Thank you for joining us. Bye.